There's uh, some strange stories in the Bible, and um, it might be awkward, it might be easy to pass over and to just forget about, but they're in the Bible for a reason, and we need to find out what God is saying to us through them. Genesis 9, starting at verse 18, is what we're going to look at tonight. Noah and the curse of Canaan. The sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the people of the whole earth were dispersed. Noah began to be a man of the soil, and he planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Then Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned backward, and they did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants, shall he be to his brothers. And he also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years. All the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. You know, if you're, if you're reading through Genesis and you get up to the part where we started, and you, you kind of took out this story and just went with chapter 10, it, it would have flowed pretty nicely you know, this story is kind of felt, feels like it's kind of stuck in there a little bit. Well, what's, what's going on here? It's a, it's a story that kind of is almost like a, another creation story where there's a, there's, oh, there's a world that's made new after an apocalyptic flood. And then there's kind of a fall and, and a curse and shame and nakedness from there on. So we're, it's a little bit of a... A rehashing of Genesis 1 through 3 a little bit. In verses 18 and 19, it kind of starts it out there. The, the whole world is being started again. They are just coming off of the flood, and that would, be a, that would just be a whole sermon in itself, trying to imagine what a world would look like and what it would be like if you had to come off of that ark and into a devastated world of a flood, and what it would be like to start again. That must have been quite a, quite a deal. But Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and all people on earth are descended from one of those three. So in verses 20 and 21, Noah plants a vineyard, he gets drunk on the wine, and he lays naked. Plants a vineyard, gets drunk on the wine, he's... And he's laying there uncovered. Now, wine is, a, is usually a biblical symbol of, of joy and celebration. That's what usually it is the case. But there's also a lot of cautions, and this is one of them here. In Psalm 104, it says, You cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for man to cultivate, that he may bring forth food from the earth, and wine to gladden the heart of man. And... Not only that, but every burnt offering and peace offering had to be accompanied by a poured out libation of wine. Wine is a symbol of, of, um, of joy and celebration, but there's some caution to it also. And this is, this is one such story. You could just make a moral lesson out of this story, but there's more going on here than just moral lessons. So Noah lays there naked, passed out, drunk. And verse 22, Ham sees his father's nakedness and tells his brothers. He 
comes in, he sees his father laying there naked, and he goes out and tells Shem and Japheth. And then in verse 23, Shem and Japheth respectfully cover their father. You notice that there's a lot of detail in that verse where they're doing that. It, it's almost like the, the passage is, stops a little bit to, to give you some specific details about how they did that so that they could carefully you know, walk backwards with this covering between them and then, and then kind of maybe drop it on him in some way. I, I, it's, it's, they, they're trying, the text is being very careful to tell you that they covered him but didn't see him. They were being respectful about that. Verses 24 and 25, Noah awakes and curses Ham's son, Canaan. Canaan was the son of Ham. That was mentioned here twice before. At uh, the very beginning, uh, in verse 18, Ham was the father of Canaan. Verse 22, and Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father. That's reminding us who Canaan belongs to. And now Noah awakes and he doesn't curse Ham, he curses Canaan. It's also worth noting that these are the only recorded words of Noah. I'm sure he had a lot of other great things to say, but this is the only thing that we know he said. And it seems like a strange choice of all of the things that Noah probably could have said or could have been recorded for us. This is what's recorded. Um... I, should, I just want to mention briefly, people have used this passage to justify slavery in the South uh, before the Civil War, the justifying the slavery of, of Africans and the Atlantic slave trade and so forth. You know, Ham's son was cursed, and therefore he will be, let Canaan be his servant. And that, that argument was used. I don't have any specific quotes, but I do know that that has been used. And there's all kinds of problems with that. I'm not too worried about any of you thinking that way. Uh, but just for one, one problem is that it's not Ham that's cursed. Ham would be the father of Africans among other people. But it's not Ham that's cursed, it's Canaan. So there is a problem with that. Anyways, why is seeing Noah naked such an awful thing? Like, what's up with that? I mean, in, we're in the days of, of being in locker rooms and stuff like that, and it doesn't seem like that big of a deal, maybe? Um, I just, you know, so what, what's going on here? There's uh, some who say that, saw the nakedness of his father means something sexual of some kind. There's, there's a few people who would argue that. And there's a couple places where it says, like in Leviticus, that uncovering someone's nakedness is, is a you know, code for something sexual. Um, but, but one person put it this way, Westerners, which would be us, who are strangers to a world where discretion and familial loyalty are supreme virtues, have often felt that there must be something more to Ham's offense than appears on the surface. So people didn't really question that until, you know, us recently. Shem and Japheth's response would suggest that this is not sexual. At issue here is less seeing nakedness, and more publicizing a father's shameful moment. That is what is at issue here. This is an honor, shame culture. And this is not a particularly high moment for Noah. And instead of being discreet about it and careful about it, Ham broadcasts it. Um, I have a commentary that's written by all people who are in Africa, and uh, they, this is how they put it. Instead of discreetly covering him and leaving, Ham chose to go and tell his brothers what he had seen. 
His sin was not that he saw his father naked, but that he did not act to protect his father from shame and in fact exposed him to the ridicule of others. Honor and shame, this is a low moment for, for dad and instead of you know, being discreet about that, he exposes it. And Calvin puts it this way, we know that parents next to God are most deeply to be reverenced. And if there were neither books nor sermons, nature itself constantly inculcates this lesson upon us. It is received by common consent that piety towards parents is the mother of all virtues. This being, being respectful and honoring to your parents, your father and mother, that's the first commandment, by the way, that's directed to how we treat one another. The first four are the first table of the law, and those are all about God. The first commandment that God gives to us about how we treat one another is honor your father and your mother. Under sin, nakedness is a source of shame. Before Adam and Eve fell into sin, nakedness, who cares? You know? And, and yet, after they sinned, the, the eyes of both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And then it says, when the Lord God was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, they, they hide themselves. Once sin entered the picture, now nakedness is a source of shame. And instead of discreetly covering the shame, Ham spreads it. He tells his two, two brothers, and at this point, his two brothers would pretty much be the rest of the world. Ham literally told the world about his father's shameful moment. Dad's shame didn't stop with him. He spreads it around. So that's what really the, the problem was there. In the honor-shame culture, you want to honor your father and your mother. And you notice that that commandment doesn't say obey your father and your mother, although honoring your father and mother does have a lot of connotations of obeying, but it, it doesn't say obey, it says honor your father and your mother. Your, your mom and dad's honor are, are important and sacred. Why does Noah curse Canaan and not Ham? That's what I really wanted to know going into this passage. Why, why does Noah realize what Ham had done and curse Canaan instead? Ham was the one who did the wrong why curse Ham's youngest son? I've got some options for you that are not on your outlines, and they're in increasing order of validity and likelihood. So, A, Noah spoke in haste without knowing the whole story. But I don't think that's, the, that's a good one, because instead of Ham, it says his youngest son, when Ham is always listed in second of three sons. And the text doesn't only say when Noah awoke from his wine, it says Noah knew what his youngest son had done to him. So Noah knew what was going on. He found out somehow. So I don't think that that's the case. B, Canaan was involved in shaming Noah. Some people have speculated that maybe Canaan was the one who was spreading it, spreading it around, or he was... He was there with Ham when that happened. But this is, this is completely speculative, and if Canaan was involved, there's no reason that the text wouldn't mention that, especially since he's the one getting cursed. So that's, that, that's kind of a stretch. C, maybe Canaan was Ham's favorite, and it made the curse harsher. Maybe Noah woke up and realized what happened and didn't want to just go for Ham. He wanted to go for maybe Ham's favorite son. Again, that's all guesswork. And it kind of makes Noah very cruel and vindictive. Uh, not so sure about those options. More likely, God had already blessed Ham in uh, being fruitful and multiplying. So Ham was beyond cursing. But even that doesn't really solve why Canaan then. 
Maybe, E, may your youngest son disgrace you as mine did me. Ham was the youngest son of Noah. Canaan was the youngest son of Ham. Maybe this is a way of saying, may your youngest son curse you or shame you like mine did me. Maybe, but most likely, these verses are a prophetic pronouncement of what is to come. That these pronouncements are going to have a prophetic quality of foreshadowing what is coming. What's going to happen as the world is started anew? The rest of the whole Pentateuch, that's Genesis through Deuteronomy, and even the rest of the Old Testament history is being foretold here. Ham's children would become enemies of God's covenant people. Um, Egypt would be one of Ham's children. Egypt enslaved the Israelites for hundreds of years, where Israel's, they were Israel's original enemy, and they were synonymous with slavery and bondage. And when in Leviticus 18, and it lists all of the immoral sexual relationships, it starts by saying this, You shall not do as they do in the land of Egypt, where you lived, and you shall not do as they do in the land of Canaan, to which I am bringing you. You shall walk, not walk, rather, in their statutes. So these two are are kind of have a reputation of taking shame and spreading it. But the Canaanites in particular, Canaanites would be conquered by the descendants of Shem. When... Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt, and Joshua brought them into the promised land. The people that they conquered were the Canaanites. They did not completely drive out the Canaanites, as you might know. And the Canaanites continued to occupy the promised land. The Canaanites were notorious for sexual deviancy and child sacrifice. And their gods, the Canaanites' gods, would be Israel's downfall. They would repeatedly fall to worshiping the gods of the Canaanites, and at the very end, that's what they were still doing. They were still worshiping the gods of Canaan. So there's a lot of prophetic pronouncement of what's going on here. But what does this say to us today? Again, everything in the Old Testament somehow, in some way, speaks about Christ and our salvation. So where is that here? Not only Canaan, but all who sin are cursed. It says so in Galatians 3.10, quoting from the Old Testament. It says there, all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed be everyone who does not buy, abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. If you are sinning and have sinned, you are under a curse. It's as plain as that. That's how it worked at the beginning. And it still works that way now. Not only Canaan, all of us who have sinned, and that's all of us, are cursed because of that. And like with Noah, our sin gives us a sense of shame. Noah was laying naked, which is like shame. And our sin gives us a sense of shame too. We all have things that we've done that we are ashamed of. Things that we'd rather not other people know about. And in general too. There's a lot of people out there who kind of feel small and insignificant. And there's a lot of people out there who search for reasons to feel good about themselves. You can do psychological studies that show that if you give somebody a compliment or say something nice about them, they'll remember that. And it'll kind of go towards their, their esteem and stuff like that. We, we easily believe compliments. And we don't easily believe criticisms or put-downs. It might hurt, but we don't really accept them. So we become easily blind to our own faults and such. But the point is here is that 
Everybody, I, I would argue this, everybody out there has a sense of shame. And I think that's why pride is the most deadly of the deadly sins because it's our way of trying to cover up that shame instead of taking what is given to us in Christ. We have to build ourselves up and we have to accomplish this, that, or the other thing. We have to assert ourselves in this way, get our way, or whatever. There's all, pride can take all kinds of forms. I think that's why. Only, uh, it says there in verse 26, it says, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. That's uh, what Noah says afterwards. Only the God of Shem can rescue us from this curse and this shame. And that's why Noah blesses the God of Shem. The Lord Jesus would come from the line of Shem and he would save us. And it's just interesting that he says the God of Shem as opposed to the God of Japheth. It's because Shem would be the one who brings the salvation to us. His line would bear our Savior. So he, he is the God of Shem. It's more closer to home, Jesus took our shame upon himself hanging naked on the cross. When Jesus died on the cross, he was totally naked. In spite of what you may have seen in, in some children's books or, or movies or other things like that, where there's still loincloth there, from the biblical text, he had nothing on. They took every last piece of clothing that he had. And when he hung there, naked on the cross, he was publicly exposed to shame. And he did that because sin gives us shame. But he took that instead of us bearing that, he took that upon himself. And I like how it puts it in Galatians 3.13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. The curse of sin Jesus took upon himself including that shame, that shame of nakedness. And Jesus was also exposed to the world hanging there on that cross. And like Shem and Japheth, but Shem in particular here, like Shem, Jesus covers our shame. Jesus took that shame upon himself, and in so doing that, our shame is covered. We are dressed in his righteousness as we stand before the throne. In 1 Peter 2.6, it puts it this way. It stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying a stone in Zion, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whatever, whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Jesus has taken our shame, and if you believe in him, you will not be put to shame. People might try, but ultimately there is no shame. And Romans 4, 7 and 8. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Jesus has covered our sin. It doesn't say that, I mean, that's a key word there. It could have said sins paid for or sins forgotten, forgiven. But instead it says, blessed are those whose sins are covered. There's an image there. For, for you and I, in Christ, former sins are no longer shameful, but they show God's saving power. Um, earlier today, we heard a lot of testimonies from people at Teen Challenge and how, and they, they were upfront about where they were. They talked about the shameful things that they had done. And instead of us thinking, oh, what a terrible person you are, we think, wow, God's power is strong and mighty to save. Paul, 1 Timothy 1.13, Formerly I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent opponent. And he says, this saying is trustworthy and deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost, but I received mercy for this reason, so that in me, 
as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. Let's not carry shame anymore from the sins of our past. Jesus has covered that shame. Let's not try to earn our own way out of that shame. But let's rest in the covering of Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Our Lord Jesus, we give you thanks for covering our shame, for taking the curse of sin upon yourself so that we would not have to bear the curse or the shame. And Lord, instead of carrying shame of our past, things that we have done or undone, Lord, we, we pray that, that uh, instead we would remember you and that what is instead of shameful would be a reason to, to boast in you and your saving power at work in each of our lives. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.